I have read quite the amount of books, okay? And I just got a Kindle and I plan on even reading more books because I hate reading on my phone or a tablet, it's just terrible. But overall, if you go to Audible, I've also listened to a lot of books. I have about 114 titles in total. And if you go to my public library right here, which is just my library, I also have a lot of books. And it's not like I have books for design and decoration. No, I've actually read most of my books. So it's been way more than just 40 titles. Now, why am I telling you this? Because I want you to know that you're watching a video from someone that actually reads books about money. Is this important? The answer is no, it's not important unless that person is putting that into action. And I believe honestly that whenever you read a really good book, you can grab the life of someone and basically digest it in a week or two weeks or if it takes you a month to read a book, I don't really care. All that's important is that you're actually reading and you're actually applying. And it has given fruit, okay? So me and my wife, um, we have the average net worth of someone who's of the age of 65 years old. As you can see, I'm not the youngest cat in the world, but I'm not 65 years old either. So the point is, by reading great finance books and money books and applying the information, you can grow your wealth exponentially. And by the way, rich to me isn't someone that has a million dollars or 10 million or a billion dollars it's someone that makes more money passively than they actually need to live so if all you need to live is just a thousand dollars and you're able to make a thousand and twenty dollars from your passive income guess what you don't need to work so for me you're actually wealthy you're actually doing well you don't need ten thousand dollars a month or any of that nonsense because sometimes there is a massive hidden cost of that, and I'll talk more about that later. But in this video, I'll give you these books that I've read, and I'll give you the main pieces of knowledge that actually help me when it comes to growing my wealth and everything else. Do me a favor, guys, and also like this video. I appreciate it a ton. Now, the very first book, guys, is going to be Your Money or Your Life. I'm actually reading it right here on Kindle, and I'm on the ninth chapter, which is the last chapter. And I found out that every single time I find a great book, I always just basically stay on the, on the last chapter for a long time. And it's because I honestly don't want to finish the book. If it's really good, if it's bad, I just want to basically get it over with, okay? And by the way, it's okay to start a book and not finish it if the book is terrible because it's going to waste your time. But this book is just so good, I procrastinate on the last chapter. It's just something I do. Let me in the comments down below if you do that too. But your money or your life taught me this lesson right here, which is basically money isn't just paper. Money is time. Money is life energy. Um, what that basically means is that when you work, you are exchanging your time for money. So your time has a dollar amount. And I basically figured this out when I was basically 19 years old and I was making about $8.75 at my college doing work study. And it's about $1,000 a month or something like that. And I realized that I was going to buy a pair of shoes pair of sneakers you guys know like the collectible ones like the Jordans and these pair of sneakers cost about two hundred dollars two hundred dollars okay and to me I was like well I have the money why not right and I work hard so why not well when I actually did the math and I was like wait if I spend one hour working I make eight dollars and seventy five cents so that basically means that this pair of sneakers divided by $8.75, my per hour wage at the time, is going to be around 22 hours worth of work. Or about basically almost three days worth of work. And ever since then, things just started to click in my brain where it wasn't just a pair of shoes or a t-shirt or a new computer. These things were time. These things were costing me something. It wasn't just like money and paper, it was costing me life energy. And it changed my perspective forever because it made me be less wasteful. I no longer see like, hey, I'm gonna buy a new iPhone for $1,000. Why would I do that when I can buy a used one? Or why would I buy the latest one when I can buy another one, right? So it's kind of ridiculous, but you learn a lot from that. Now, this book also taught me a second lesson. I know I said one per book, but it's very important. So it taught me that work isn't your identity. It's just what you do for money and you have to disconnect it. And here's what happens, okay? When you're young and no one tells you who you are, 
why you exist, you know, why you're here, why everything works the way it works. By the way, I'm a Christian. I have a Christian worldview, basically meaning that, hey, I was made in the image of God. God created me for his glory. And those things are just so powerful. So I know who I am, why I exist. I'm not trying to find my meaning and my identity in a job or a career or trying to climb a corporate ladder. To me, none of those things matter. I understand that what I do for work, I do to basically make money. And the money I make is to sustain myself and to actually take care of the bills. And if I can basically get to a point where I make enough money to cover my bills passively, then why would I keep basically killing myself at a job to build some type of career that isn't going to last, you know? So those things are very important. And that actually helps you out a lot. So I'll, I'll talk more about that later because I want to kind of kind of get onto another book because I don't want to steal from the other book, okay? So number two, guys, is going to be The Richest Man in Babylon. And the lesson I learned here was basically live on less than you actually make. And that sounds terrible when you first hear it, right? Because it kind of sounds like I work hard, so why am I not allowed to enjoy it to the fullest? That's not the idea. Again, money is energy. So if you spend money on dumb things, you're going to be wasting your energy. And initially, when I was a lot younger, my whole idea was I want to live a lavish life. I want to be able to work hard to be able to earn a lot of money and all these things. So I can buy an expensive house for a half a million dollars. It's true. Um, so I can buy an expensive car for like $80,000. So I can have an income that's passive about like $10,000. I had all these expectations. And then I was like, this is ridiculous. It's stupid. What you're actually signing up for is a 30-year problem with a house. You're buying a house, you're buying a car that's going to cost you a ton of money and it's going to lose a ton of value instead of buying something that's just basically reliable. And then lastly, to get to an income of $10,000 passively, it's not impossible, but it takes a lot of work. And work, again, is time and time is money. So you think about it, like, do you really need $10,000 a month? My answer was, I don't need to have $10,000 a month whatsoever. So you take a look at it, right? So to make $120,000 a year passively, just $10,000 a month, you have to basically just multiply it by 25. And that's the amount of money you have to have, or 20. That's the amount of money you actually need to have in the stock market, for example. Um, so times 20, that's going to be $2.4 million. So if I take out 5% of $2.4 million, that's going to give me basically $120,000. So I was like, well, I need $2.4 million. How long is that going to take me? Like 20, like 30, maybe 40 years? That's ridiculous. And I don't want to use my youth to basically take a lot of risks and basically waste it on work. I'd rather use my youth and my energy to try to build a good foundation so I don't have to worry about money. But this was basically way too much. These days, I can basically live on less than $1,000. So basically saying, instead of actually needing $120,000, well, if I just need $12,000, by the way, more like $24,000, I wanna live like a good life, at least for me personally and my wife, well, that's going to be times 20, just 480K. How long does that take me? A lot less. And since it takes me a lot less, that means, hey, I don't need to work as much and spend so much time in a job. And by the way, does this mean, but Tommy, you're not gonna be able to have the big house. I don't need a big house. You're not gonna be able to drive the expensive car. I don't need an expensive car. You're not gonna be able to have that $10,000 income. I don't need that. To buy, to do what? To buy more things that I don't need? You know what I mean? So these things open you up a lot. The more you read about money and wealth, if you read the right books, they're supposed to take your mindset from a consumer mindset over into a, I want to build wealth so I can enjoy life and not try to work until I die, basically. Um, then number three is going to be man of the house. I'm, I'm on the last chapter of this book and I've been on the last chapter for like about a month. I just don't want to pick it up and I don't wanna finish that book, okay? It's, it's, it's so good. Um, but before I read this book, I did not realize how reliant and how useless, in a sense, I actually am, you know? So as a man, I have a job, right? And if there's a problem in the house, I call somebody to fix it. If there's food that needs to be get done, basically to buy food, I give money, the food gets bought. All these things get bought with money. And I feel like I'm actually providing something, but the truth is, 
I don't know how to do anything. You know what I mean? So I don't, well, at the time, I didn't know how to do anything around the house. I didn't know how to fix the dryer and the washer. I didn't know how to, the, the, the sink goes bad. How do you fix that? You know, I don't know how to do anything, you know? So I realized that that's not really providing. I don't even know how to grow food. I'm so reliant. So if I lose my job, my money, I don't know how to do anything with these hands to actually keep the house sustained. So the big lesson in this book is that you want to focus on building a home, not buying some expensive house. And that changed me forever because these days a house is like a condo and I don't have any kids, but it's kind of like that. I've been in homes with kids and kids come home. They don't have a relationship with their parents because the relationship is basically with their friends outside of the house. Um, the, the couple comes home and they talk to each other a little bit, but they're both tired from work to just stay in this household. That's so important. Um, but it's all ridiculous. So it changed my mindset from trying to buy a nice house in a nice neighborhood with my neighbors to be able to have my wife work in a fancy job and to have me work in a fancy job to being saying, to say, hey, how do I have a lifestyle where my wife can stay at home, where I can work the least amount of possible, where I can take care of the home, where I can educate my kids from home as in homeschooling. And I was like, it's better off that I buy a piece of land and I built a house and I have animals there to have like food for the family and everything else. Now, it sounds like I'm becoming like one of those homestead channels or whatever, but I see a lot of value in that to be able to know where your food comes from, to be able to provide for your family, um, to be able to educate your own kids. And you might say, Tommy, homeschool kids don't get to interact with people. Homeschool kids, that's not the most efficient way to actually educate your kids. The truth is, when you look at the stats, they perform better education-wise. And on top of that, public schools and private schools, in reality, it's not like it's the best thing. It's just the most efficient thing. What's more efficient? To have me and my wife teach my kids, right? two of our kids or five of our kids or eight, I don't know how many kids we're gonna have, right? But, or to have one teacher teach 20 or 35 kids or whatever, what's really better? The answer is a household. But what's more efficient? One person teaches 35. You see what I'm saying here? And it's not the same level of attention. And kids do still socialize with themselves, with the church, where you actually put them. It's, it's not true. It's more like a myth, if you ask me. So that's what I learned from that book. That's a choice. You got to make it for yourself. But I really recommend that book, okay? It's very, very powerful. And it also teaches you exactly how to focus on creating passive income in different ways. And by the way, the less money you need, the better off you're going to be. If you don't have to worry about food bills anymore because you can grow your own food. If And by the way, it's not like you know, like have everything you need, but a lot less because you can get the meat from your, from your house. You can get most of things from your house, right? It's buying a big plot of land, not to make money from it, but to sustain the household itself. Now, number four, guys, is going to be the little book about investing. Or it's, yeah, I think it's that. Yeah, the little book about common sense investing. There you go, that's the right title. It's by John C. Bogle. Um, this book taught me early on how to simplify investing. As an investor in the beginning, you kind of want to do a lot of things. You want to pick your stocks or you want to pick um, active mutual funds or you want to pick, for example, uh, a, a, a conglomerate of different index funds and so on to balance it out or whatever. And I took this book even further. Like I made things a lot more simple. My only investment is this, okay? I don't pick stocks because I don't plan on having a career in picking stocks and it takes a lot of time and research and if you're not up to date with things, things can switch and you can't make adjustments and you will lose your money. And I don't pick, for example, a bunch of different index funds because I understand exactly what I'm investing into. So my only investment, I'm being honest here, as far as stocks per se, is just into the S&P 500. That's the 500 largest companies in the US. Now what happens if the US loses everything it has? I lose everything I have. But what else happens? Well, your US dollar doesn't matter anymore because our trust basically goes down the toilet. On top of that, the whole entire international economy also most likely is going to suffer a lot because the whole intertwined economy or the world economy is so intertwined like a little web, okay? So if we don't have anything, China's gonna suffer and other nations are also gonna suffer. So all the investments are gonna suffer also, okay? That's the idea. So that's why, that's my sole investment. That's the only place I put my money. Is it very lavish? No, I don't make 20% a year. I might make 10 to 11% on average, and that's good enough for me, okay? That is the idea. The more simple your investments can be, the better your life can be overall. Complexity is not your friend. You don't want complexity. Now, 
Number five is going to be the barefoot investor. And by the way, I should say something. When it comes to investing, you want conviction. I got to just one investment over years of investing by understanding how investing works and doing research. But you have to do your own research too, okay? That's how you get conviction. Now, number five is going to be the barefoot investor. Almost every single book on this list, everyone is going to share with you guys a different perspective on how to get to the finish line of financial independence. You're going to have a five-step plan, a nine-step plan, a bunch of different ideas, okay? But what I've learned is when I'm reading one of those books, I usually ignore the whole step system and I'm trying to find a nugget a piece of information that changes my life and I, then I can come on here and probably try to change your life also. And in this book, it was this, okay? You're never going to be debt free unless you make the choice to be debt free. And at the time I had credit cards, I had student loan debt, I had business loan debt, but I had enough cash to be able to basically take care of all the debt. But in my brain, in my big smart brain, I was like, I can use the cash to make me more money and basically pay the debt on itself, right? So I can use leverage. And when I read that part of the book and I read the whole book, and by the way, understand something. I'm giving you the nuggets of the book, but you have to read the book. Reading a book is kind of like getting like trained. There's a lot of information that is going to train your brain. And when things happen, you're going to think about the book. Just me giving you one piece of information isn't going to be that helpful overall. Now, when I read that part of the book, I was like, I have credit card debt because I have to use the credit cards to keep them open. So I decided I don't want to be in debt ever again. I don't want to use that. I don't want to play the game. And that book basically helped me decide that. And being debt free means you don't owe anybody any money. You're not in bondage to anyone, okay? And you might be in debt for a period of time, maybe when you buy a home the right way. Um, where the home is no more than a third of your monthly income on a 15 year mortgage. That way you can be done with it fast. But I went ahead and I closed all my credit cards because I don't care about maintaining a credit score. I don't care about having points or whatever. I just don't want to be in debt. I paid off all of my debts. I don't care that I can basically make more money in the market because I want to be debt free. And once I did that, I can basically sleep at night knowing that I don't have anyone that I'm in bondage to financially, in a sense, except God, obviously. Now, number six, and the last book on this list is going to be The Psychology of Money. It's a short book, um, but it's a good book. And the main takeaway here is that what it takes to build wealth is not what it takes to keep wealth. And I learned that because initially, to be able to grow the wealth that I have today, or that we have today as a family, well, I had to take on a lot of risks early on, you know, before I got married. But in order to keep this wealth, if I take the same level of risk I took then, then I might lose everything. So conserve, to conserve your wealth is different than to actually grow your wealth. And that's very important. I have friends, for example, that don't know when to slow down, that don't know that maybe the best decision is to just go slow and study forever. I have a friend, for example, that his whole mindset is, I want to be richer and richer and richer, and then I'll focus on stability. And now, because he's in so much debt and everything else, he might never have stability, you know, because he's risking everything. So that's very important to know. Guys, these are just six books and about like seven lessons or so and examples. I hope it actually helps you, but I hope it motivates you to just read one of these books, okay? Grab a book. I recommend, honestly, The Richest Man in Babylon. Read that one first. If you like stories, read that one. If you just want like more information, read The Psychology of Money. If you are more interested in about like how to live a better life overall, read um, The Man of the House. It's such a powerful book, man. But thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time and peace. Subscribe to the channel.